Hi, my name is Joshua Sachs, and today with Young Hu Lee, I'll be presenting Detecting Handcrafted Social Engineering Emails with a Bleeding Edge Neural Language Model. A bit about us before getting into the talk. I'm Chief Scientist at Sophos. Sophos is a security products and services company. We have a whole range of security products ranging from firewalls to mobile security to email security to endpoint security. Um, and the team that I manage, Sophos AI, is the AI shop inside of Sophos. We research and develop the company's machine learning technology, and then we're also responsible for operationalizing that technology in service of defending about 100 million endpoints. Young Huli is, is one of the uh, star researchers on, on my team. He's uh, almost completely uh, solely responsible for the machine learning subsystem that protect our Android customers, um, it, at least for, uh, he's responsible for the, the R&D part of that work. Uh, he's also the principal author of the work presented today. I'm presenting in a supporting role here. I'll mostly just be setting the stage for the original work that Young Hu is gonna describe. So the problem we're solving. Uh, most generally, we're, so we're working on the problem of detecting phishing emails. More specifically, we're, we're working on detecting business email compromise, phishing emails, and, and targeted phishing emails. So to understand what this is, it's useful to say what it's not. We're, we're not focused on uh, detecting mass campaigns where uh, detection reduces to a near duplicate detection problem uh, because attackers are just sending out millions of copies of basically the same phishing email. Uh, detecting those types of emails turns out to be a side effect of our focus, but our, our real focus is on detecting new custom authored uh, bes bespoke phishing emails that are based on research on a target. And this diagram does a good job of getting across the kind of workflow we're, we're looking at stopping. And in this workflow, cyber criminals and attackers identify targets through open source research, uh, usually on the web. Then they, then they establish contact with, with those targets. In step two, uh, we call this grooming. It, in this case, they put out a lure, an initial email, usually or sometimes an initial text message. Uh, and then build trust and, and authenticity around some identity that they're impersonating uh, with, with the mark. In step three, they, they cash out the trust that they've built with their targets and make an ask of those targets. Oftentimes that ask would, will be around wiring money or sending credentials. And then in step four, they actually um, um, receive money or receive the credentials. Um, so, so within targeted phishing, business email compromise, which is focused on, on stealing money from businesses and other organizations, has been a growing trend. So as you can see here in July 2016, a few billion dollars were stolen, according to the FBI, uh, through business email compromise attacks. And these are targeted phishing attacks that extort money from organizations. In May 2017, that number had grown to almost six billion. And in 2018, that number had grown to more than 12 billion. I, I don't have data for the last two years, but I, I see no reason to believe that, um, that this trend is attenuated. I think it's likely it's continued on a similar trajectory. Uh, this is a big problem. Uh, we see this in, in Sophos's customer base, which is, which is a pretty large sample. Uh, we also hear about it from um, other folks in the cybersecurity space. Uh, and so we're very focused on it because it's affecting people. Uh, and it's not just affecting large organizations. You can see on this, on the axis on the right, that something like um, 80,000 organizations uh, had been hit by, by July 2018 by these attacks. Uh, um, so there are lots of small and mid-sized organizations getting hit. And oftentimes the financial damage can be in the hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and, and really impact people's lives when, when these attacks happened. So, um, so again, just to reiterate, we're focused on, on primarily these business email compromise use cases, but also more generally targeted phishing in which, um, in which a lot of manual labor goes into uh, the phishing process on the criminal actor side. Um, and I think it, it almost goes without saying, but we're, we're focused on step two and three of, of these criminal actors workflow. Uh, the steps that are mediated over email. So, that, so we see lots of malicious emails uh, um, exchanged in the grooming step. And then we also see, um, obviously, a malicious email transmitted in the exchange of information step where the attacker makes the ask of the, of the target, usually employee. Um, 
um, and this is just because we're focused on email as our, as our signal, um, and that's the scope of the work that I'll be talking about today. Just to flesh this out a little bit, here's an example. Uh, phishing email sent in the later uh, um, sort of epics of the, of the grooming stage of an attacker's workflow. Here, the attacker has um, established themselves as an impersonated uh, um, chancellor of UC Berkeley. They are emailing an employee at UC Berkeley asking if they're available, looking to exchange mes messages with them, probably about to make an ask around uh, a money transfer. Now, I, I think it's important to highlight why phishing detection is hard and uh, why in particular detecting new previously unseen phishing emails writ written as part of uh, a manual phishing campaign like what I've just described um, is, is hard. Uh, and what this boils down to, I, I think, is, is that classical natural language processing problems are hard. It's hard to get computers to understand language in any meaningful way and reason about language in any meaningful way. And detecting phishing emails really boils down to uh, building models that have some level of understanding of language. Uh, so, so to understand why, it, why algorithmically it's hard to make sense of language, let's look at a few classical natural language processing problems. So one of those is co-reference resolution. To, to get a sense of, of what this problem uh, means, uh, consider the following sentence. I went to the store for some milk and based on the price, decided to buy it. Now, from a grammatical perspective, it could refer to the store or to the milk, right? It's possible that I went to the store for some milk and based on the price of the store, I decided to buy it. Um, but it's more likely that, that I bought the milk. Um, as, as humans, uh, in, in solving this co-reference resolution problem, so, so resolving what it refers to, uh, we have to plumb the depths of um, a number of, of complex mental models, right? We need, to, we, we need to deploy our syntactical model of the English language, our semantic model of the English language, and our model of the world in which a person is more likely to have uh, bought milk at the store than have bought the store itself. Um, and that's how we solve this problem. Uh, hopefully it's clear uh, that it's hard to get algorithms to do that. But to detect phishing emails, uh, we really need to understand language. And this is, a, this is a, a problem that's constituent of the problem of understanding language. Word polysemy is also a classic problem in algorithmic understanding of language. So a sentence like, he drank a lot and was quite the rake. Uh, uh, gr grammatically, it's valid to interpret this sentence as meaning that he drank a lot and was quite the, the, the garden tool used to, to rake leaves off your lawn. Um, that's clearly not the right, that's not the sense in which the word rake is being used. The, rank, the word rake is being used in the sense of a, a drunk, semi-criminal, uh, sort of dissolute uh, individual here. Um, but it takes uh, a pretty deep exercise of uh, a human being's mental models to, to arrive at, at the, the sense in which this word was used and not easy to reproduce um, in the form of an automated agent, either machine learning or, or, or based on regexes and rules. Sentiment detection is another hard problem in natural language processing. So consider the sentence, I'm not angry at all. No, of course. Why would I be angry that you spent our life savings on your mistress? So clearly this, this, the speaker is angry here and they're being sarcastic. Uh, detecting that they're angry and, and sarcastic is uh, not trivial and requires that we understand um, not only the syntactic structure of the sentence, but also the, the semantics of the sentence uh, and requires that we have the reflex that, that this person is probably angry if, if their interlocutor uh, spent their life savings on their mistress. Um, okay, so, so to solve phishing means that we need algorithms that can make sense of language. Making sense of language is hard, as these three problems demonstrate. Um, uh, so a good f solution to the phishing problem um, would, would model um, um, as intermediate steps to detecting that an that a, that a email is a phishing email. At some level, be able to solve these problems and, and so somewhere in, in the depths of it is intermediate representation of the language that it's looking at. Um, the other challenge we have, obviously, in any cybersecurity problem, or at least any detection context in cybersecurity, is that we have adversaries who'd like to bypass our detection, and that's also worth considering. So these are all reasons why the, the problem that we're presenting here is, is a hard one, deserves, we haven't solved it completely, uh, deserves attention from our, from our community. Now, the, the approach that we're using uh, to attack the phishing problem 
is based in neural networks and deep learning um, in a specific advance that happened uh, in the last few years uh, known as transformers. Um, so transformers, or, or more specifically transformer blocks, are a new kind of construct in uh, neural networks, uh, much, like, much like convolutions were new, I think, as of the 90s or late 80s, and backpropagation was a, was a new idea in neural networks, I think, starting in the, in the 80s. Uh, transformers are a new idea that's come out in, in recent years, um, and they help model language uh, with a depth and fidelity that seems to be genuinely new and represent a step function in our ability to model language. Uh, so they're very exciting. Uh, the big idea behind the work that we're presenting today is that we're taking transformers and applying them to a cybersecurity problem, which we haven't seen much of before. So I'm going to talk a bit about what transformers are. Uh, a detailed discussion of, of how they work is beyond the scope of this talk, but I'm going to give some intuition. And then, and then I'll pass, um, pass the mic um, metaphorically over to Young Hu, who will, pre will present on how we're using transformers. OK, so here's an example which I think helps to illustrate uh, some ways in which transformers represent a, a, real, a real breakthrough in machine uh, comprehension of, of language. So in, in this example, and I expect some of you have seen this because this, this sort of went viral uh, last year, uh, a, a researcher wrote a prompt. Um, this prompt is given at the top here um, in a shocking finding, that, that paragraph. Uh, and then a transformer model um, just sort of took it from there and wrote a story based on that prompt. Um, and I think I think when you when you see the story that the machine wrote, um, you'll see that that it betrays um, uh, a understanding of the syntax and semantics of, of language uh, that's quite striking. So I think it's worth reading this out loud. The, the the human written prompt reads: In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorn spoke perfect English. And now again, the challenge to the model is to see if it can pick up where the human left off and write something coherent. And if it can, that reflects something around its ability to solve problems like the fundamental problems I, I, I described earlier. So the, 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 the neural network continues. This, the scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz and several companions, were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noticed that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain, surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. Perez and the others then ventured further into the valley. By the time we reached the top of one peak, the water looked blue with some crystals on top, said Perez. And, and the essay continues. Um, but what interested Young Hu and I in, in seeing examples of what transformers can do like this is that uh, it seems that the transformers have, it, it, examples like these suggest that the transformers have understood the syntax and semantics of the English language to some degree, and which begs the question, could, could the representations that uh, the transformers learn in their, in their parameter structure uh, be useful in detecting phishing emails since, since these transformer models seem to have um, distilled knowledge of how language works and, and, and what it means um, um, within, their, within their parameter settings. Okay, so this is one example of a sort of impressive example of what transformers can do um, that beg the question of whether or not they could, they could be applied usefully to phishing. Uh, and we'll show results from our experiments later in, in Young Hu's section. Here's another example of just how um, uh, sort of marvelous transformer models are with respect to um, uh, how much more sophisticated they seem to be. So, so here, here, a, here a researcher typed, in a, typed into this box a description of some HTML that he would like the transformer model to generate. He writes, a button with the color of Donald Trump's hair. And the model actually writes uh, um, as a text completion uh, some HTML and CSS. It seems to understand that Donald Trump has yellow hair, and, uh, and it makes a button, and it writes valid HTML and, and, and CSS, um, which is, um, I think, just, a, just 
impressive in the absolute sense, but also for folks who've been in the NLP space for a while, it's impressive relatively five, 10 years ago, if you would have shown somebody that, that we could do this um, in 2020, I think they would have um, they would have been a bit incredulous. Uh, this is a big step for you. Applications like these uh, represent a big step forward in natural language processing. And they're, they're due again to this new idea um, called uh, transformer block. Or that's the that's the key building block out of which uh, models like like this model, which is called GPT three, it's from OpenAI, uh, which is an AI uh, research lab, um, are, are based. Okay. So moving on. So I I, I want to go back a little bit um, in the history of NLP to dis, uh, as a way of of describing how transformers are are new and different. So I, I assume a substantial chunk of, of our audience today has studied uh, basic uh, machine learning on text. Um, and typically in like a machine learning 101 course, uh, you learn about the bag of words model and about discrete, uh, discrete states, Markov models of language. Um, and I wanna talk about these representations uh, as a way of talking about how li limited th those representations were. And then I'll talk about how transformers uh, break us free of some of those limitations. So a, a bag of words model of a, of a document is a way of representing a document numerically for the purposes of machine learning in which we just count up how many times each word in that document appeared. Um, and then we create a matrix out of all the documents we have um, and all the words in all those documents. Uh, and the entries in those matrix are just word counts. So, the, the, so in, in, in the case uh, on the left over here, the, the column vectors in our matrix are documents and uh, they get one dimension per word in our vocabulary and they get counts of how many times words appeared um, in that vocabulary in the entries of, of that particular vector. Um, and it, hopefully it's intuitive that, you know, once you've represented your documents in, in a vocabulary space in this way, you can compare documents by taking some distance measure uh, between pairs of documents. You can also train machine learning models uh, on your document corpus to say classify news articles as about sports or politics. Uh, but um, what you've done in the first step of, of these models is, uh, is drop out sequence information. So you've, you've forgotten about which words uh, come in which order in the document. Um, and you've just represented your document as a bag of words, um, which is a useful simplifying assumption. And it's one that um, we still use today in some of the modeling we do in, in, in my research group at, at Sophos. Um, but it throws out a ton of information that transformers and more modern models don't throw out. Um, and the model on the right is a, we have a discrete state Markov model of, of language. Um, here, each word is a state. And um, the, the concept of language given by the model um, is kind of a choose your own adventure story in which the, in which the next word uh, in an utterance depends only on the current word, um, and you're just sort of drawing from a prob probability distribution and moving through this graph um, to generate language. Uh, you could never have generated anything close to that unicorn story using a Markov model, and yet as recently as the last five, ten years, um, there's lots of papers coming out around like using hidden Markov models to um, parse sentences and that kind of thing. Um, these are still useful models, um, but we've gone far beyond the simplifying assumptions uh, in these original um, um, sort of simplified models of the world um, in, in NLP from the past few decades. Uh, so let, let's, contrast, let's contrast transformers now, and I'll get into more details about how transformers work in a second, but let's, trans let's, let's contrast transformers with these earlier natural language processing approaches. So, Pre-transformer, pre most n machine learning approaches didn't consider words in context. Uh, many approaches um, made the, the, the simplifying bag of word, words assumptions um, um, as kind of a first step in, in the modeling process and then ran, ran term vectors through the models like, um, like topic models or logistic regression um, or support vector machines. Um, most models didn't didn't model kind of like co-reference um, uh, relationships between words or sort of which words pertain to which other words in a sentence. Um, and I'll talk about how, what that means later. But transformers do sort of solve that problem. Um, uh, most most approaches didn't. Um, most approaches operated on either words or, or characters. Um, 
transformers have typically the way people use transformers um, we use uh, well chosen chunks of words um, which allows us to model misspellings and this kind of thing um, so there's been an improvement there in the current generation of natural language processing models um, and uh, older approaches tended not to use neural network technology that's changed a lot in the last 10 years um, but um, transformers are, are transformers transformers leverage some of the be best ideas in um, that have come out uh, of the neural network revolution um, that's been ongoing since around 2012. Uh, so transformers uh, kind of kick apart a number of log jams in um, in natural language modeling. They give they give words contextual representations. They they model attention, like the relationship between words um, in a document. They use these smart partial word representations that allow for misspellings and, and just the Tower of Babel of vernaculars that, it, that appear um, um, like under the banner of, say, the English language on, on the internet. And they take advantage of ideas like, like residual connections and um, modern optimizers and, and many of the, the, the really good ideas that have come out of the neural network rev resolution, uh, revolution. So these are all, all reasons why we wanted to test their, their applicability to phishing detection. Okay, so um, so if you want to get into detail about how transformers work, I'd recommend this blog post by Jay um, Alamar. Uh, it's where I created this uh, screenshot here. I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of the series of matrix multiplications that comprise um, a and summations and, and various linear algebra and operations that, that comprise a transformer block. I just want to give a little bit of intuition here before passing uh, passing the mic over to, to Young Hu. Uh, the, the basic idea behind um, a transformer block, which is kind of a Lego block um, out of which you build a transformer-based neural network, is we're, we're taking in a sequence of words. Uh, um, this diagram shows a very simple example where we're just taking a sequence of two words. Typically, we take in um, a larger window, like 512 words. Uh, we, we pass them into the block. Um, and the, the, way, the way to get passed in is um, as not just... Uh, not just as entries in a term vector matrix, but actually as vectors themselves. So the words get a vector representation. These are known as embeddings. Um, and um, uh, we, we, we pass them both into the transformer network. Um, the, 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 first, the first thing that the transformer network does uh, to, to our input word sequence is model the, the attention um, relationships between the, the words. Uh, so basically, I mean, in, in a two-word case, it's a little bit hard, harder to describe here. But basically, if you had like a sequence of like 15 words, for every word, it, the attention mechanism would, would compute how much attention, how much, how much that word pertains to the other 14 words in the sentence. Um, and you'll, you'll see how that has a relationship with like the co-reference resolution um, problem I talked about earlier. But it's just intuitive that there's a graph of words um, word relationships in a sentence and self-attention kind of mo models that in terms of which subjects you know um, um, pertain to which objects um, which pronouns pertain to which people etc um, there's an addition and normalization step that that happens when we've we've sort of run this self-attention process um, a number of times um, it, uh, typically, we don't just do self-attention once. We have a number of what are called heads, and we, when we, we run attention a number of times. We combine all that, that together. We do some nonlinear transformation on it, and then we wind up with a new embedding of our or original sequence of the same dimensionality as this original embedding, except that now thinking is, is encoded in the, this new representation in the context in which it appears, in the context of machines. Machines is encoded in the context of thinking. And then typically, we stack these transformer blocks, so we actually do... We have another transformer block that then sort of refines the representation, and we keep we keep going. Um, Young who will show that we use a number of transformer blocks in our phishing detection work in a few minutes. Uh, so here's some intuition intuition as to what comes out of the attention mechanism um, in uh, a typical transformer. So so here's here's what a transformer block has decided it um, uh, sort of relates to in an input sentence. So here we have the, the input sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Um, and the, str the strongest attentional relationship here um, uh, goes to the animal, which is interesting because uh, one could ask whether or not it refers to the street or the animal here. Um, one can interpret the weight of the connection to the anim animal, meaning that the transformer block um, 
has decided, in, in air quotes, um, that it pertains to the animal, which is really interesting. Um, so hopefully you get some intuition as to how powerful this attentional representation is and how important it is in, 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 in machine learning models, gaining some what we might call understanding over the, over the language that they're analyzing. Okay, so I want to put the intuition together around how transformers pertain to the, the work that Young, Hu, and I are presenting today. Um, so basically, what, what we're going to do in our phishing model is embed an email uh, as a sequence of embedding embedded um, uh, character sequence vectors. And then we're going to run that through a series of transformer blocks, like what I just showed, um, that are going to uh, create a very re refined... Um, attentional representation um, of uh, the word sequences um, and then produce these contextual embeddings that, that, that get at the meaning of the words in the context in which they appear. And then finally, uh, our network is going to solve a classification task to say whether or not the email is a phishing email or not. Um, how all that magic works, how the network gets trained, which there's some tricks there that are really cool, um, uh, I'll leave to Young Hu. And, um, Hope a lot of this makes sense, and happy to take questions about my piece of this presentation uh, later at the end of the talk. Thank you, Joshi. Let me continue the second part of our talk. The second part will include our design decisions for catbot and performance result. Catbot is the name of our email model context-aware tiny bot. The model size is tiny, but it is mighty bot. Modern NLP models all have a nice and friendly name. For example, Elmo was introduced 2018. The model used bi-directional LSTMs to generate contextualized word embeddings. And then, same year later, Google researchers introduced BOT and achieved the state-of-art performance in many English understanding problems. Next year, 2019, Baidu researchers introduced the ONI and the model achieved another state-of-art performance in many Chinese language understanding problems. They are all popular characters from Sesame Street. This year, 2020, we introduced CatBot to tackle email security problems. Transformer-based NLP models are powerful, but they are complex and heavy. And it is challenging to deploy heavy models for real-time applications. So our first design goal is to convert the heavy model into lightweight model so we can reduce number of parameters and then we can improve implant speed. We downsized a baseline model called Distribot, which has six transformer blocks. We take half of transformer blocks from pre-trained model and then replace missing transformers with simple adapters. For example here, we take transform 135 and then we added uh, two adapters. Also we can take other number of transform blocks. This approach allows us simply significantly reduce number of parameters. The second goal is to improve the model performance by combining additional input. Standard NLP models only accept text data as input. However, we can extract additional features from email headers 
and we can use the additional input to the mod to our model. So the text input will be the input to the embedding, and then we can add additional input to the classification adder, and we added additional dense layers in the classification to combine the input from transformer block and another headed rated input. With the additional input, we improved our model's performance further. Let me talk about the details of our trans uh, adapters. We inserted the two adapters here, and each adapter has quite a simple architecture. Each adapter will have two dense layers and there is one nonlinear activation unit in between, and we have a skip connection. The dimensionality of the dense unit are same as the output of transformer blocks. And the two dense layers are initialized with near zero values. So as initially, the adapters will act as uh, identity blocks, but however, they will gradually change the data from the low transform block to upper transform block and to minimize classification loss. We also modified the standard fine-tuning method by using a partial fine-tuning method. Standard fine-tuning involves operating all parameters jointly. However, partial fine-tuning, we only operate upper blocks, but we fix lower blocks. For example, here, the lower blocks embedding the transform of 1 and 3 are fixed, but we update uh, adapter 1 and 2 and transform 5 and classification header. This approach was to minimize forgetting problems of learned presentations from uh, low transform blocks. As mentioned earlier, we have two set of features, one from text data and another one from email headers. We can use multiple email header filters, for example, from two CC reply filters to extract additional context information. And we consider the subject and the text as context input. The first set of pieces are from email text, content features. We extract text data from subject and plain text body. If only HTML content is available, then we can also extract plain text from HTML data using a HTML parser. For example, uh, this one is a, a simple HTML hyperlink, and but we only extract the visible text visit bank site as output. And then from the extract text, we remove uh, less informative characters. We remove uh, digit and punctuation characters. The second example, there are many hyphens, but the hyphens will be removed in the, this step. Otherwise, each hyphen will be uh, individual token. Finally, we select 120 tokens as input to the transformer blocks. We use a word subword token as called word piece. The word piece tokenized can overcome some of the limitations from character level or uh, word level tokens. 
characterable tokens are too fine grained, so it is hard to recognize word boundaries and the meaning of words. And uh, word level tokens often have out of vocabulary problems. The sub word token tokenize can split complex or uncommon words into sub tokens. For example, cat bot can be divided into simple cat and bot, and double has is a indicate for sub word. Similarly, sopos can be divided into three tokens, SO, PH, and OS. The sub word tokenize uh, reduce number of unknown tokens in our email data. With the selected tokens, uh, the tokens will be input to the embedding layer and then we have three transformer blocks and each transformer block has 12 multi-head attention layers and each individual attention layer learns contextual relationship between tokens. And the, the light diagram shows attention weight between tokens. The transport token has multiple attention weight for other tokens. In our email data, we have many non-English emails. And also non-English emails can include English uh, Waters also English emails can include non English waters. The non English emails account for 25% of our total benign and malicious emails. So we needed to support a multilingual model which can recognize different languages. How we can support multilingual emails? The solution is BOT comes with two versions, English and multilingual BOT. The English version was pre-trained with large English text data sets including Wikipedia and has 30,000 English tokens. The multilingual version was pre-trained with large text data sets from more than 100 languages and this version has four times large vocabulary size which is 120 tokens which will cover many Unicode characters and uh, Unicode words. So we fine-tuned a multilingual bot for our multilingual emails. The second set of results from email headers we can extract multiple indicators from email head builders. For example, the first one, uh, we check whether the emails are from internal or external. We can compare the domain of recipient and the sender. For example, here, uh, the domain name is a, uh, is a similar looking one but actually there is extra x so this one we consider as external email and then uh, we can also uh, use uh, external reply by comparing the domain of prom and reply to open uh, targeted phishing attack attackers use uh, on a different domain for reply to and also we uh, collect size of recipients and the size of the carbon copy recipients as additional indicators. It is obvious that uh, targeted phishing attacks will have only single recipient. However, many uh, user business emails will have multiple recipients or carbon copy recipients.
Next, we will have a look at the performance of our catbot. Let's have a look at the performance of a catbot. We used a data set of 10 million P9 samples, and the data set also includes 350 phishing emails and 1000 PC emails. We used time split to allocate 70% of samples as a training and remaining 30% for test samples. We included we included two baseline models to compare catbot. The first one is distillbot, which has six transformer blocks. And another one is LSTM, long short memory. The model is a recurrent neural network architecture, which also used BART's same embedding layer. We trained the three models on a GPU instance from AWS and we assigned high sample weight for the PC samples and over sample minor class malicious samples to allocate balanced samples in each mini batch. To compare performance, we use our curves and area on the curve. Also, we compare inference speed and the model size as key performance metrics. These are curves compare our catbot model with two baseline models. The top blue one is catbot and the second one is distillbot and the bottom green one is LSTM. Our model outperformed the two baseline models. And our model uh, achieved 0.82 positive rate at 0.1% false positive rate. Next, we compare the performance when we remove adapters and the context input rated layers. The top one is catbot, and the second orange one is when we removed adapters, and uh, the bottom one is when context input was removed from the catbot. We can see significant performance drop when we remove either adapter or context input, which demonstrate we can improve performance by using additional adapters and the context rated layers. Next, we compare the performance of three models with targeted BC samples. We assigned high sample weight for BC samples and we achieved high performance for detecting those BC samples and the catbot up of the two baseline models. Next, we compare performance for phishing emails. We divide the phishing emails into two groups, English and non-English emails. Our catbot are performed for English and non-English emails. And our model was based on the multilingual bot, so we can see significant performance when we use the model to detect non-English emails. When it compares with simple LST model. Next, we compare the inference speed. The bot has six transformer blocks and the cat bot has three transformer blocks. So we achieve two times speed up in inference time when we measure the performance on a CPU machine. As the number of blocks decrease, the inference, team, inference time can be reduced. 
next model size. For comparison, we divide the model size into two parts, embedding and transformer blocks. Digital bot has six transformers and has 92 million parameters for embedding and 42 million parameters for transformer blocks. Digital and the cat bot has six transformer blocks. We reuse the same embedding parameters, but we reduce the number of parameters for transformer blocks by 50%. In total, our model size is 85% of baseline model. When we apply the same mechanism for English version, the English cat bot will have 70 1% of parameters from baseline model. Next, we will inspect how CatBot generates outputs. We use a LIME method to interpret our predictions. LIME is a local interpretable model agnostic explanation method which can be applied to any black box models. We can understand a model by perturbing the input and understanding how the predictions change. The first line example is for a benign email. The prediction score for this email is close to zero and we highlight legitimate tokens with blue color and malicious ones as the orange one. And this one we don't have any high weighted tokens for malicious ones. Next we have a PC sample. The model prediction score for maliciousness is close to 1 and the model recognized transfer and urgent payment as high weighted tokens. Next we have another piece sample uh, which is related with gift card and the model prediction score is close to 1 and card and urgent tree. The tokens are high weighted for this email. Next, we have two handcrafted social engineering emails. They look quite different, but if we read the text carefully, they are asking the same wire transfer and uh, model predictions are close to one for both emails and uh, the highlight tokens are payment and swift or as soon as possible. This example demonstrated our model's ability to understand complex text and uh, conceptually similar emails can be identified. In conclusion, our catbot is a carefully the architecture transform based model. With this architecture, we achieve both high speed and high accuracy in detecting handicrafted social engineering email attacks. In the future, we want to apply the same design decisions to new GPT-3 model. Thank you. Do you have any questions?